is one fine looking cartoon of a fine looking band, isn't it? Yes, drawn by the great Jamie Vida. That is anti scene. And if you see anti scene, then you know that you are tuned in to the right internet channel for this, the latest episode of the anti scene shoot interview series hosted by moi, Malcolm Tent. From Danbury, Connecticut, Minister of Propaganda for Anti Scene Incorporated, and the bass player for the Almighty Anti Scene, and the host of the Shoot interview series. And we got him back for another one, kids. The Mad Brother Ward story is a real mass of twisted roots and twigs and leaves and branches, and it all is attached to one trunk. The trunk that we can see is illustrated right here on my backdrop. The almighty anti-scene. Mad Brother Ward, say hello to the people. Hey, hello, people. I got junk in my trunk. Mm. Trunk full of funk. Full of a lot of spunk. <laughs> Mad Brother Ward might even be more awake than I am right now. So we're not going to have any fall to roll. No snafu. We're going to get right down to it. We are in the middle of part two of the Mad Brother Ward auto discography. If you've seen any of the shoot interviews we've done in the past, we've gone with Mad Brother Ward all the way from his days as a frantic fan to a friend of a band, a friend of the band, to an associate and co-worker with the band, to member of the band. And we're right now in the middle of talking about his recorded output with Anti-Scene. And we are right up to this album right here, Dying Breed. What on earth can you tell us about the making and creation of Dying Breed? Dying Breed. Um, well, you know, we have these all night rides home from shows sometimes, you, as you are very well aware of now. And uh, ordinarily, at least until you came along, I would ride shotgun up front with Jeff and Jeff would drive. He'd make the all night drive, you know, from wherever we were going. And sometimes some of our ideas get kind of hatched while we're up, you know, thinking. And one of the ideas that they had long had was doing a follow-up to the Hell covers compilation that they had done in the 90s, which I think they wanted to do something called Heaven. And uh I kind of took it and spun it on its end. I was like, you know, what we ought to do is instead of doing just, you know, random covers of stuff we like, we should pick songs of bands that we personally know, bands that, you know, have in some way been, you know, uh, inspiring us in, 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 uh, on a more direct level not just like covering a Ramon song or whatever, or, you know, nothing wrong with that. But instead it's like, why can't we, we should do stuff like the bands that we've played shows with bands that, you know, maybe Jeff has helped at some point or, you know, this sort of thing. And that's what got this kind of whole thing spinning was like, you know, a tribute album to, to people that we actually knew that you know maybe other people never it got exposed to because they're just bands that play in their own town you know opening for the bands that come through and that sort of thing so and then it kind of extended back to like well jeff was like you know i've always wanted to cover a, a white cross song because he was a big fan of white cross uh from richmond virginia old old school hardcore you know and that kind of, I think, was the uh, real, you know, the very first thing that sparked. It was like, yeah, you know, we could, you know, and that would started it. And it, it expanded from there. And uh, it was like, well, we also ought to do a knife dance song. Because I really like that song on fire, which is what opens the, the record. And it just went from there. And then we chose, like, uh, a Dead King song. And then, you know, like, if you've got the record in front of you, we did... Uh, should I just go track by track on this? Yeah, why not? We're already three quarters of the way from side one. 
Yeah, so we started on, you know, I don't remember the first song we recorded. The first song we started with was Jump Up, the White Cross song. The record opens with On Fire, which I think I was really happy with the way that turned out. Um, we tried to do a different Dead King song. Initially, we were going to do a song of theirs called Drama Queen, and we just it just didn't pull together the way we wanted to, and we kind of then defaulted and then switched over to do Run You Down. Um then the self-made monster song hook. I uh, can't remember the reasoning in, de in deciding to do that, but we do it a little bit different. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the monsters also kind of, you know, they're kind of similar to, to us in, a, in, in that they'll do like a lot of kind of, well, not us. We, we like the, uh, Eddie actually helped on the uh, obstinate record, the, the, uh, atomic clock the noise thing because monsters sometimes do does stuff like that so we kind of do a little stretch of that in the middle of the hook as kind of a nod to their kind of free form you know kind of free jazz influence kind of thing so um then we did a you know a kiff song knowledge is for fools it's like taking candy from a baby baby um the only thing that came out of this left field that doesn't fit the paradigm of all events that we know was the Crazy Horses cover by the Osmonds. And Jeff just really, really, really wanted to do that. And so it, you know, it's sort of an anomaly in the mid middle of this, but, uh, you know, it, it, it still plays into the, the influence, I guess. And then um, I brought in the song Fred Kirby, which closes it. Uh, there's guys that wrote that are uh, the band the Loose Lug Nuts and the uh, brothers that uh, owned the Thirsty Beaver in Charlotte where bands played a couple of times and also the Tipsy Burrow, which is where we do our Christmas stuff now usually. And they've got a record out. And uh, But that song, Fred Kirby, jumped out to me. I can remember them playing it. That's where I first heard and caught it was when they were playing it live. Fred Kirby locally was uh, like a children's TV host uh, kind of a singing cowboy character and um, was real kind of popular in the probably maybe even as far back as the 50s but certainly the 60s and 70s and up into the 80s and he would by the 80s he was hosting uh, you know the local little rascals thing which is why that starts with that's Fred Kirby actually singing it if anyone has the record and heard that it opens with Fred Kirby singing we love the little rascals you know that's that's that was kind of you know his whole thing he also would uh he was i mean he was pretty well known he would do you know appearances at a up in the mountains there's a kind of a amusement park called tweetsie railroad you know kind of a cowboy town old railroad thing and he was you know he was prominent figure up there and such so you know and the song is really about it's not just about fred kirby but it's also about pro wrestling and just the way Charlotte was once upon a time and kind of a, you know, and I, I, I was like, Jeff, you got to hear this song, man. And he was like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when he heard it, it was like, oh, God damn, <laughs> you know? And, and it was like, then it was like, it was on. We had to do it. So that's, um, you know, and I wrote it, I wrote the whole, it's all explained on the back of the record here, the, the short little liner note where I wrote about the, you know, another co covers collection, you know, but this is bands which have inspired or influenced us from childhood to today. So, um, you know, it, it meant, I, I think it meant, it, for as much as I hope it meant to the bands that we did this for, it meant that much to us to do, at least me and Jeff and Barry. You know, the, the dark side of this is this is really kind of the splinter with Gooch because he was not into doing this at all. And that's, you know, that's, uh, you know, I think he stepped up for most of it. There was a couple where he just, you, you know, he, he would just he just didn't like the song and was going to do the bare minimum. And, um you know, I, I don't want to sit here and run the guy down or nothing, but like when we did the Fred Kirby song, 
that turned into a nightmare because we showed up one morning to, to cut it and uh, he showed up and we were just trying to get the, the drum track down basically to build off of. So he lays the drum track down and, uh, and it was fine. And me and Barry started getting into it to start tracking it out because this was a little bit different because it's got the acoustic guitar and stuff on it. And uh, something happened while we were doing that and Barry lost the track, which unusual slip of the deal with Barry. So we had to call Gooch back to come back and start it over again. Well, somewhere between him leaving and coming back, I'm hearing, am I, what am I hearing there? I'm hearing some, a grouchy cat. You're, you're hearing your story is being interrupted by a rare appearance or actually non-appearance by Harry the cat, who as usual is off camera making a racket while you're trying to talk. And I don't think anybody's ever seen Harry the cat on one of these things, but he's always over there. And <laughs> you're, you're telling this deep, this deep, heavy story about the recording of the album. And so he comes in and starts saying hi maybe i'll edit that part out maybe i won't because it's just been one of those days man look, hey man he, he needs us 15 minutes he got it i didn't even know there was a harry the cat so no. but i'm not at all surprised Typical. <laughs> so we're doing this fred kirby thing and like i said gooch had, it came in and actually he cut a pretty good drum track initially and then we lost it and somewhere between him leaving and coming back he perhaps ingested something that he didn't need to ingest. I don't know. But he came back and played the most dull, lifeless drum track of any of these songs. And, but, you know, we soldiered ahead. He split again and we kept on, okay. I mean, we spent probably eight or 10 hours trying to do this thing that day. And we, we you know, we got into it again, multi-layered some guitars, and we're sitting there and we were listening to it. And I was just like, man, this sucks. This just flat out fucking sucks. What are we going to do? And we kind of thought about it. And then it was like, fuck it. And we started all over again. And Barry played the drums on it. Mm -hmm. So Barry plays drums on Fred Kirby. Mm. Um, but now to be fair. And then by then, you know, I, I had lost all faith in the song. And it wasn't until the record actually got finished and mixed and I finally heard it again. And I was like, man, that turned out pretty good. There was supposed to be a part in the turnaround on it that had electric guitar. And I don't think they were able to mix that in in a way that was doable. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so they lost that. So that's the only, that's my only regret on it. It had a couple of chords where the electric was supposed to buzz in on the top of it and that didn't make it. But, um, you know, those things happen while you're doing it. But uh, Given all the problems that we went through to get that song done, it's still, I, I think it turned out great. It's still my favorite thing on this record. I mean, I mean On Fire is pretty fucking hot too. And I mean, I like, I, and I love all these songs, so it's kind of hard to pick one. But I think just because we put so much effort into getting that down and the way it turned out, you know, I was just really, really, really surprised by it. No, it's um, good. It's good. And I, and I love the concept, you know, as, as a touring, you know, guy doing my solo acoustic thing or ultra bunny or, of course, with the anti scene. I'm always struck by bands who are really, really good, as you were saying earlier, that no one would ever hear of outside of their immediate environment because they don't tour. They might not even ever record anything. So it's really cool that you guys pick some stuff that people would not know about normally. I think. Actually, to be fair, I think all these bands, you know, have their have their own releases. Uh, yeah, all of them do. So, you know, but like, I, you know, Knowledge is for Fools plays primarily just in Raleigh. You know, they played the uh, the um, what 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 was the that? The, the Rule Breakers Ball in in down in San Antonio. And they were um, the Self Made Monsters have been together. God. 25 years and you know they just they're not a very they, you know they're just not the type that really aggressively promote themselves or push themselves they'll take shows on a, on a random occasion but you know 
that's just not, you know, it's just not their vibe. They're not worried about it. They just do their thing. And, you know, that it is what it is. So, yeah, you know, and it, they're my favorite band. They're like my favorite North Carolina band, you know, after and I seen it was like so many monsters. I just think they're the, the, the fucking shit. Um, Day Kings were, you know, good friends of ours. I actually played uh, at least one show as a drummer, as the drummer for the Dead Kings one time up in Pittsburgh. So, you know, those guys have been real tight. And, you know, I was like, I was really high on doing the song Drama Queen. That's the one I really wanted to do. It's a great song. And 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 uh, we just, I think if Gooch hadn't been so difficult and nudging and pushing, we would have found it. But he just, you know, I, and that's probably not fair to blame it on him. But, you know, he was, he just wasn't into doing any of this for some reason. Um you know, jump up. It was just like it's just a killer song anyway. And you know, the only the only the other the other thing, and I don't even know if Jeff's aware of this. Crazy horses. We started in on trying to learn that, and at that point, we were trying to get it done. And I felt like I was becoming a flat tire in that one. I was having a hard time catching it. So, don't tell anybody. Barry plays guitar on Crazy Horses. Mm, Mr. Fix-It himself. So Barry, Barry does drums on Fred Kirby and guitar on Crazy Horses. Because it was quicker to do it that way. Otherwise, you know, it was going to take longer than it needed to take. And, um, the, you know, the original idea coming into this was um, we were going to try to, it was supposed to be done real quick. I think we were going to, we were coming out of doing if I remember right, this was the year we did the tour with Zeke. So that would have been the fall of 2017. Is that right? I don't, I don't know. But I was just, the point was, the original idea was like, this is something we should be able to throw together fairly quickly, you know, I mean, and, and do it successfully, not, not flippantly, but quickly inefficiently because we don't have to write songs we don't even have you know to arrange it we don't have we just have to figure out how to play them and get them solid and record them choo, 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 choo. and i thought this will take you know a month six weeks and it'll be in the pipeline well it didn't happen that way it took forever because you know again we just ran into some pushback and then you know, the holidays came around. We were trying to play some shows, and we have to, of course, stay sharp on getting set up. I mean, there's there's other mitigating factors or whatever, but of course, once once you get into it, it, it came together. But um, but that's pretty much the story behind it. I think that was the beginning, the real you know the fracture with uh, with Gooch kind of getting disillusioned with what what we were you know we were kind of going one way, and I don't think he was really on board with it. You know, which that's fair. That's, you know, that stuff happens, but, um, you know, we got it done and I think it turned out really, really strong. I, I, I'm really proud of this record. I think it's, you know, I think it's, uh, cool. We got to do it. And I, like I said, I hope that the bands, you know, have enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed doing it. Yeah, I don't know if the Osmonds could really get behind it, but for you know myself, <laughs> for myself as a child of the '70s, I I loved seeing and then hearing Crazy Horses. Like, that's an awesome song, man. Like the the Osmonds, at least for two or three minutes in 1970, whatever, rocked really hard. And cheers to Anti Scene for capturing that in a bottle. There's a, I you know I should have grabbed it. I, there's a an edition of that record that we had pressed just for the 35th anniversary and um i guess it's a like a silver vinyl edition of it and i think that actually came out before we were trying to get that out right right around the same time i get lost in the timeline of how these things came out jeff could probably tell you better but um you know, and the whole thing is we did it in secret. We didn't want those bands knowing that we did it. And the way they would find out is when we actually physically gave them a copy, you know, or mailed them a copy. They would get the record and be like, oh, they sent me a record. And then look twice and go, oh, shit, they did our song, you know. Yeah. We thought that would be fun to do it that way. So that's that's that was also part of the, 
the fun of making that, you know. Well, wait, did you send one to the Osmonds? That I do not know the answer. You'll have to ask Jeff that. Mm -hmm. Probably not because, you know, you don't want to hear from their lawyers. No, that's true. They do operate on a certain level, don't they? And I'm not going to mess with any uh, Latter-day Saints lawyers. No. No. <laughs> or all 600 of their wives. Um, <laughs> so, I guess that pushes us on along down the, the pipeline. And you know, I, I just feel like I'm missing something somewhere, but I I, I want to say there's a single in line somewhere in there, but I think, but anyway, whatever. The next up on the on the release thing was when we finally got to go to Japan. Um, part of the what they what the uh, company that brought us over there did. They had us tied in with a band over there called Ryuketsu Blizzard. And um, to tie in for these shows that we were doing, they issued a CD single that is a split with Ryu, can you see that? Ryuketsu Blizzard. And then on the other side is our contribution. Two songs that came off of, uh, well, one came off of uh, We're Number One and one comes off of Obstinate. So I don't even know how many people stateside even knows this exists. There's only uh, a handful. I don't even know how many were pressed. It's just a CD single. And, um, and like uh, Jeff was throwing them out at the Christmas shows. So yeah, I know there, there's some scattered about that were, you know, and then I, I guess them, I saw them flying through the air and it's like, I want one of those. <laughs> uh, so I just think, you know, I like the, I like the economy of that, that cover, you know, it's the, the, the walking Jeff and the, you know, kind of scratch logo. So yeah, it's good. That, the, it's a really arcane format these days. The CD single. Who even remembers CD singles? Uh, apparently, the Japanese do. There you go. And Ryu Ketsu were such a cool band. Great people. We had so much fun with those people. Um, and they were just like, it's just some next level insanity the way they play, their whole approach to everything. And it's like, uh, it's just hard to describe. You just it's something you'd have to kind of witness. Um, well, I think anybody who like was a fan of especially like early '80s Japanese hardcore will understand what you're saying because there was really this intensity that the yeah. Japanese bands attacked it. When I say attacked, I mean attacked it with really. Yeah. Really there was a when we played with them the first night. The uh, Millie Bison is a girl that plays guitar for him, and she's just playing so hard and so intense at one point there's like a barricade that goes across the front of the stage and she goes up against it and just just doesn't end over and i was like did she do that on purpose you know because you can't tell because of the intensity of the way they played um i found out later no she didn't do it on purpose she just just you know she was just at that point but she popped right back up never missed a note you know like so, because and because, she, or at least I didn't notice her messing up. I was, I, you know, because she didn't mess up. I just assumed it was part of the show. No, nope. she just was rocking that hard. And I was like, oh, I gotta up my game. Yeah, uh, yeah, I gotta do a backflip or a Paul Stanley roll in order to compete with that kind of a stage move. Yeah, well, I'm yeah, I'm not doing a Paul Stanley roll. <laughs> Good, because uh, I'll just I'll just go on record right now as saying that might be maybe the single worst moment in a kiss video ever <laughs> no, no 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 there's worse and let's not even go there that's going to be a whole different topic especially if we get barry if we can get barry to sit down in front of the camera and we can uh, dissecting good, kiss videos good luck with that i don't know but, kiss videos no yeah, yeah you never know you never know so that puts us in Japan, right? Yeah. And <laughs> do I need to talk about Japan any? 
Well, we like Jeff has gone on quite a bit about Japan. Of course, the release from it, the live in Japan. I mean, the packaging is awesome. The concept is awesome. The sound is raw as hell, and it's great. Um, it's got a fake Obi on the front cover. I mean, gatefold sleeve. I mean, what what can you say that Jeff hasn't said? What can you add to the dialogue that we haven't already waxed rhapsodic about? I mean, I can only talk from my own perspective about the whole experience of doing that. Um, you know, I, I'll tell you this. Um, when we came, you know, while we were there, we realized they were recording the shows from the board. And, you know, immediately, without even a second thought, Mark Rainey was like, live in Japan. And 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 the credit where credit is due, Gooch is the one who was like, "Oh, it ought to be white vinyl with the red center sticker," you know. D yeah, you know that's fucking great. And um, so you know, it was like we were already, you know, steps ahead while we were on the ground there, you know, on the first day, and um, or on the second day, with you know, the day after we realized they were recording. And um, so we were getting, you know, these board recordings of, of all the shows. And, um, you know, figured we would figure out how to put it together later after the fact, which is, of course, what happened. And I can remember once we got home and I got to hear it for the first time, um, I went up to Barry's to listen to it. And um, we, it got to the end where... You know, I was telling some friends about this last night. We the last night we were there, we played one of those wrestling uh, death match things, <coughs> and they had us come out as kind of like the. They did this ceremony at the beginning of the whole show, and that went the way it was set up was they would have a couple of matches, and a band would play, a couple more matches, and another band would play. So they had, uh, there was Ryuketsu played and a, a band called Abigail played. And then we played last after they had finished all the matches. And uh, we were like the guests of honor. And Jeff was like the grand dignitary, grand poobah. I don't know. They had him call the night into order or whatever. And they had us come down. We had these sashes on. And, you know, the, you know, they do everything ceremonially. And uh, just at the front of that, at this at the start of night, when we came down to the ring and did that, and the whole crowd was chanting Jeff Clayton, Jeff Clayton, and that was like, that was I was like, that is fucking cool. I did not expect that, you know. It, it, it was even better because it was Jeff's birthday, mm -hmm. and it was like, you know. I was thinking, you know, we're, we're, you know, initially I was thinking, oh, how how many people here at this show are going to even really know that what we're what we're doing or why we're here or anything? And when you know you come down and straight out of the shoot, they're chanting Jeff's name. And it was, <laughs> I was just like, God damn, yeah. and and you know, uh, the then you know we played the super intense set. And uh, at the end of it, which is on the record, they were chanting, you know, please don't go, please don't go. And I had kind of forgotten about that. I thought that was really cool in the moment. But, you know, while I was there, that whole trip, I was kind of just focused on the next thing we had to do, the next thing we get to do, you know, because we had such a short window of opportunity, you know, while we were there on the ground, everything had to be kind of like, I was just, you know, kept moving forward and I knew that even going into it that I wouldn't really begin to really appreciate and, and understand what we had done until we got home because my mind just sort of doesn't work like that like I said I kind of got the blinders on while we were there and um, you know when I got home that's when it started really going wow damn you know that's <laughs> it was a fucking cool thing to do and when I went up to Barry's and heard that recording for the first time and it got to the end with that and I got, I'm going to lie, I got emotional. It was just like, 
that's a you know for for I think for all of us that was just a really special moment that the, you know you get you you know and I, I almost feel guilty in a way because that's like I put in some work but not like the work like you know and I thought of this too when we on the second night um, the bands that we played with Ryoketsu and then we played with um, a band called Shootmaster and they wanted to do a song with us and we closed our show with the other two bands joining us to do fuck all y'all and they played it like like they'd been playing it for years it was everybody all at once it was this massive and that's on the record um and i remember thinking at soundcheck just thinking god i wish you know i almost felt it's like god i just wish joe young could have seen this and experienced this and known that you know something that this guy did you know from lenore and this other guy from new london north carolina you know, put together and put into motion 30 plus years ago has carried over into this whole other culture via this shared subculture, you know, and you've got this thing that, you know, who would have ever thought that? So I don't know if I'm making any sense whatsoever, but I just, I mean, I guess the, the, the short end of it is just, yeah, the, the whole Japanese experience was about the most amazing thing I've ever been a part of. Yeah, no doubt. I'm, I'm envious, jealous, uh, covetous, you name it. Because to, to go and play your brand of rock and roll anywhere is, you know, it's awesome to be able to do it anywhere. But, dude, Japan, forget it. That's, that's stratospheric. That's a whole other level right there. And it, here it is on album yeehaw and the packaging in that is amazing I, I mine's not open yeah me neither i've got my 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 open copy is on the other side of the house i just have my sealed archival copy but i think it it's it's best served if anybody doesn't already have this to get it and just be surprised by what you see when you crack it open and unfold it, everything it's really something it rivals kiss alive too it might be better than kiss alive too like the front cover Better than better. Kiss Alive 2, baby. Better. Yeah. Back cover? Better than Kiss yeah. Alive 2. Yeah, I agree. I'm not going to, you know. No, I'm, I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to argue. I, I totally agree. I'm not even joking, man. When Kiss Alive 2 was supposed to come out, there was all this hype for it. And, you know, excitement was high. And I remember going to the Treasury Department store and looking for it. And they hadn't even put them out yet. There was this great big shopping cart full of Kiss Alive 2s because it was a Friday night. And I guess they were going to come out on Saturday. And I was like, there they are. And I pulled one out of the cart and I looked at it and was like, hmm, it's really not that exciting, is it? No, well, you got it. I, to be fair, that, that inner sleeve, the inner gatefold is pretty fucking badass. But that you is. know what? You know what else is badass? The inner gatefold alive in Japan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And the bonus inserts and the goodies. We'll let the, the educated consumer find out. It's Yeah, it's good. It's good. Uh, suffice oh. it to say, buy on site. Yeah. Don't delay. You'll regret it. All right. What could possibly follow that up, man? Let's, we got a few things left here in the anti-scene discography featuring Mad Brother Ward. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I, might, I don't know if I'm in the same order as you. Well, the thing I've got next is, of course... That's where I'm at. Okay, yeah, yes. Cool. Right on. Yes, The Multiple Moods of Malcolm Tent. I've, I've sung the praises of this album many, many times. Um, I'll just briefly sum it up. It's my 35-year career, retros 35 year career retrospective. It's got many of the bands that I've been in, including a band I had just freshly joined, the Almighty Anti-Scene. And we have on this a live track from the tour we've talked about a little bit with I Hate God and the Obsessed, Sabu, and it's red hot. What are, what are your impressions and memories of that tour, Mad Brother Ward? Um, well, that's where the break with, with Gooch came. And I remember saying before the anniversary show, I remember telling Jeff at one point, don't be surprised if we show up one day and all his shit's gone. But then he kind of started to rally a little bit. We got through the anniversary show. We got through Japan. We did another show when we got back. And 
you know, and I just kind of thought, well, you know, he went, he, you know, and to be fair, he had a, a serious shit storm in his personal life, which, you know, I won't discuss for anybody's benefit. And so, you know, it's not, it wasn't all, you know, ugliness or nothing like that. But sure enough, we did, we showed up one day and all the shit was gone. And I walked in, I didn't even notice it. I walked in and, and Barry and Jeff are sitting there at the package room and, I, and I'm, they're just sort of looking at me funny and I'm going, okay, I'm walking into something. I don't know what's going on here, but I'm just going to, I'm not selling it. Right. You know, and I'm waiting for somebody to say something. I don't know what it is. And finally Barry goes, are you, did you not notice something's missing? And I turned around and I was like, Oh, you know, none of this shit's here. <laughs> and I was like, well, the, the, and the downside was we were two weeks out from this tour with I hate God. And we were like, well, fuck, what are we going to do? Well, we're not canceling the tour. <coughs> we'll figure, we're going to figure something out. And, you know, the immediate thought was, well, Barry can play drums. You know, so we're, we, all we need is to find someone that can play bass. And there was like a handful of people who we thought of and you were on that short list and you were the first one to reply back. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it was done. That was it. The, the decision. I mean, it, within, within, you know, I mean, literally it, it had to have been within an hour with, for me showing up and then within an hour you had said, yeah, we're on. Wow. So we just sat down and got busy, me and Barry, you know, working the setup until you got there. And when you hit the ground, you, you'd done your homework. And we, I mean, you know, the fact that that came together the way it did, as quickly as it did, and as good as it did, really as great as it did, you know, that's the, that whole tour is the most is probably the proudest moment I have of the band as a musical, you know, unit, whatever you want to call it, because by rights, that should have been a disaster mm -hmm. or could have been a disaster that, that could have came off any number of ways of bad, but everyone came in focused, ready to fucking nail down the shit and you know, and, and there's still, I've, I've got video on my phone. You know, that was the tour. Um, Drew Toth worked for us, and he filmed a lot of that on his phone, and I've got a lot of those videos. And and then there's a video on YouTube somebody filmed in Lexington, Kentucky. Was it Lexington? Yeah, Lexington. That's a good one. That, and I'm just, every time I look at that, I'm just like, God damn, man, you know, we're on fire there. You know, it's like. There's a, but I think the best show we did on that run was um, was Tampa or Ebor City or where you know. Yeah, the Chicken City. Yeah. <laughs> that that show, because I've got some video of that, and I was just like, man, because I I remember that night. And I, I'm going too off the script here, but I'm just I'm just getting I guess get getting to the point. Um, but I remember that night Jeff was kind of feeling a little run down, and he was like, we might cut a couple songs off. And I'm like, cool, whatever you want to do. Because we had to make that run to get to uh, Hattiesburg. Mm -hmm. And so, and then he kind of rallied and was like, nah, we'll just, you know, we're going to fucking drill. And we did. And it was just like, there's some video of that. And I just remember that being a really good set. That night. I was like, by then we were really, we had really locked in. So, you know, I just think that whole trip just showed, you know, I think that's a testimony to just the the spirit of the band. I mean, the perseverance. It's like, you know, make shit hard on us. Well, we're going to make it 10 times harder on you, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> I, mean, I, I personally, man, I'm still kind of buzzing from the whole thing, you know? I mean, for me, that was also like a, a career highlight because I always had this kind of scenario in the back of my mind. I thought, you know, maybe someday I'll, I'll give Jeff Clayton a call and ask if I can play bass for anti-scene for just one show, you know? Maybe I can just go down there and be the guest bass player for a show. I'd be really psyched if I could just do that, you know? And then I got to play 10, you know? <laughs> it was great.
Well, let me ask you a question, Malcolm Tiff. No, oh, yeah. What? Now, you recorded every single show on that run. Yeah. And you recorded it like it's like it's not ambient audio uh, audience recording. This is multi-track recording, right? Yeah, I, I drag. I've got my portable 16 track, and I, you know, as you saw, every single night I find a place to put it. Mic every amp individually. Mic the drums up and try to get a line off the board and get multi-tracks of every night. Yeah. And you've gone through every one of those shows. Oh yeah, every one of them. So what was your criteria when you chose this particular version of Sabu? Yeah. Um, best sound quality. It, re it really wasn't an issue of best performance because, you know, uh, as they say, if you got them, smoke them. I'm just going to tell it like it is. All the performances were killer. You know, the occasional flubs here, you know, a little mistake there. But overall, like there was not one stinker of a show anywhere in that run. So it's just a matter of finding the best recording with the fewest flaws. And at the end of the whole thing, uh, there were there were two shows that came out best, the uh, Jacksonville and Chapel Hill were the two best recordings. And so I culled through those and actually sequenced a live album, you know, because Jeff and I were talking about it and at the time I was just like the utility guy and I was going to, you know, fill in for this one tour and that was pretty much going to be the end of it so we figured well let's do a souvenir album of it and so with that in mind i put together i have an i have an entire live album from that tour sequenced mastered and basically ready to go and um I, when it came when i started putting this thing together and i really wanted to have anti-scene on it so i asked just asked jeff if it was okay he said yeah and sabu was just song i love playing that song is red hot so i said all right we're gonna put sabu on there because i just love that song and the recording was great i sent it to john bowman he you know gave it some buff and polish mastered it and voila everything just fell right into place for that one recording of that one song and that one is from jacksonville and it's funny because talking to Jeff afterwards, he thought Jacksonville wasn't a very good show. He was. Yeah, really I don't either. I, 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 that's why I kind of I, part of the reason why I asked why you chose Jacksonville, because, you know, I mean, I, you know, I guess it was OK, but. I don't, I just don't remember, you know, like I said, my, I remember my, the shows I can remember in my, in, from my perspective, you know, were particular shows and Jacksonville wouldn't have been one that I would have chosen as being like, you know, a, a, an especially memorable one. Well, you know, what, the thing that made it a great performance was all the things that could have made it a bad performance. Cause you know, it was, I think a Wednesday night in Jacksonville, Jacksonville's a soft market anyway. So Wednesday night, the, I think that was the, the smallest crowd we had on the whole tour. I, I think even, you know, by the time I Hate God came on there, might maybe a hundred people there. Maybe, yeah. You know? Yeah. I, you know, but I don't remember, I don't remember holding back or pulling back nothing. I, I thought we, you know, I just, you know, I'm trying to remember there was something about that night that was like, you know what I think it was? This is going to sound dumb. You know, Jeff will wet his hair. And the, I don't remember that stage was made out of some sort of parquet flooring or something. Yeah, it was kind of bouncy. And and it turned, but when he got the floor wet, it was like a sheet of ice. Uh -huh. and, I, and, and I can't get any grip on my feet. And, you know, uh -huh. it, it, I'm, I'm just, I'm just like, you know, I'm out of my mind. I'm like, I'm going to fall. I'm going to fall, you know. <laughs> Not, I think all, all of that added up to i think we just ended up playing harder because once again if you look at the videos jeff goes out into the crowd mm. and, like, he really laid into it a lot harder trying to win this crowd and i didn't find anything wrong with it i was getting the energy off the crowd as, as small as it was they were enthusiastic i had people yeah like, God, thank you thank you for coming to jacksonville i've been waiting years to see you you know so the energy was there it was just smaller we played jacksonville once before to a kind of a, a bigger well I, in my mind it was a bigger crowd it was, but it was our audience is in, in in as much as it was our show 
And uh, evidently, it seemed like I was told that night is one of those scene things where like one side, if you play on in one club on one side of the town, you know, there's an audience that won't go there because of some scene feudal something bullshit, you know. Yeah, I heard about that too. You know, we ran into that in Nashville one time. It was the same kind of thing, even though we had a really killer show in Nashville one time. Um, but yeah, I just was curious how you came to chose that particular recording because uh, I didn't, you know, I just remember that show as not being... But, you know, again, performance, like you said, I, you, you know, and a lot of times you can't really judge what you've done in the moment until you have a, or, you know, the, the ability to reflect on it. And you had all the recordings, so you, you, yeah, you got I, a more true reflection of what, what was going on. Totally. And I had the time, you know, to, to go over it with a microscope. And the thing I've, I've always, 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 always said is the artist is the worst judge of their own work. Absolutely. Yeah. The people on stage are the first one to go, oh, it was terrible, you know. Mm. Meanwhile, everybody else is like, oh, worship, worship. So I, it, it was, it's, a, it's been a, a kind of a tough lesson to learn over the many, many years, but I finally have learned to just get out there, burn them to a crisp, and just be satisfied that the job got done. Doesn't matter what I think, it's, it's cool. Well, going back again, like we said, that the, that we even pulled the whole thing off. I even that first night in Atlanta, that show was great. I just coming out of the shoot, like by all rights, I was expecting, okay, the first show is going to be a little loose, blah blah blah. No, I mean, and we were, and we had a great response in Atlanta. You know, with their notoriously jaded audience, yeah, really responded to it. I, you know, I felt good playing. I, I don't know. I was just, like I said, the fact that we were able to kind of take a very heavy negative and turn it into a very solid positive, you know, it's just something I'm really proud of as a band that, you know, the band that, you know, in this era that I'm a part of, it's a major achievement, you know. I mean, yeah, going to Japan was a major achievement, but, you know, this was something that we really you know, this was on a different level. Does that make any sense? Like this was something we really had to really work on. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I, I just, I'm like, fuck, you know, (laughs) it's just like, I was really happy about it. So. And plus it was a great tour, man. The obsessed. I mean, I got, we got to see the obsessed 10 nights. We got to see, I hate God 10 nights. Awesome people. Every single one of them. And we forgot one little factoid, man. We did that whole thing with two, rehearsals two rehearsals did we only rehearse twice twice once with jeff once without that was it okay well then there you go yeah i knew it was you see i'm getting it locked in my head now from when you've come down for the other stuff so yeah. i'm like yeah only two rehearsals god two rehearsals. damn that's i think that i think that's worth getting on the permanent record right here yeah you know there you go there you go <laughs> We earned it, man. I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> people are watching this now going, well, they just jerk themselves off a little bit harder. <laughs> Why don't we? Why don't we? <laughs> you know, it, 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 it ain't, it ain't uh, what's the old saying? It's not hype if it's true. It's not. Yeah. Ego. It ain't bragging if you can do it. Exactly. So I think our people understand it. They they know we're good. We know that. So it's all right. Yeah, well, the important part is, like I said, I think it just shows the the perseverance of of the band, you know, and, you know, and a big part of that is that, you know, um, the determination of Jeff, you know, the fact that he, you know, he he just doesn't knuckle under under shit like that, you know. Yeah. And I don't think that, and going back, you know, I'm not going to sit here and shit all over Gooch at all. I mean, like I said, he had his problems and he had his whatever, but the way he handled that wasn't cool, but. You know, uh, I think we came out stronger for it on the on the on the back end. Yeah, I would I would tend to agree, and I'm I'm just I'm just saying that only from my own perspective of how easy everything is with this band, man. I I've I've I wasn't ever expecting any problems. I have not had any problems, as Barry would say. Goddamn professional is how anti scene is run. You know, and, and for somebody coming in from pretty much the outside and seeing just how tight of a ship it is, it's it's damned impressive. And, um, you know, 
you know, one of my favorite factoids is it's a 13 and a half hour drive from where I am to where you are. I don't mind because it's worth it. It's worth every one of those 800 ish miles because I know when I get to Charlotte, there's going to be some ass kicking and I love being a part of it, man. I really, really do. Well, it's it it says a lot that you even have the the dedication to do something like that. I mean, that speaks highly of you. And you have, you know, I think one thing that really helped was you coming in was that we were already kind of, I think we have a similar kind of attack to our instruments anyway. The way we play, it's like we locked in really well, just naturally. Yeah, I don't know how to. I don't know exactly how to explain that. You know, we don't play against each other. You know, it was a real empathy, and this is where Barry's got to get a lot of credit, man, because Barry is the easiest drummer in the world to play with. Because I'm going to go ahead and say it, he doesn't mess up. I can't think. He does it what? He doesn't mess up. I mean, does he? I have yeah. known him to mess yeah. up ever. Like if he, right. he, if he plays the song a certain way, that's the way the song is supposed to go. And so like, you know, even on occasions, if my, if my mind might start to wander as it does occasionally, all I have to do is listen to Barry and I, I know exactly where we are without fail. So he, in my mind, we've got this whole simpatico thing where you and I have a similar approach, a similar attack. And Barry is just always right there where he needs to be. And plus, it sounds like a, a damned H-bomb going off when he plays. And I like that, too. Oh, absolutely. So let's push this along here. Yeah, man. I think we are now to Season's Beatings. There it is, the Christmas record. Woo! Now, I'm trying to remember where the start of this came okay actually i'm going by my memory this actually predates to the previous christmas where we had the idea that we should do a christmas record and then it was kind of like well what do we do and you know how would we do it because um i think a big inspiration at least for me was the creamer seven inch from back in the day where they do the song Father Christmas, and then they had an original song called Bob Kringle. And I love that record. And it was a cool record because on one side, it had both songs, and then you flipped it over, and it had the etching into the vinyl. And um, so, but we, and we had covered, we played Father Christmas at a Christmas show that we did the year or two prior. And we knew, well, we can't record it because, you know, they had done it and, you know, and then Jeff came out of left field with this uh, Snoopy's Christmas, which I wasn't completely familiar with. And, you know, that's one of those things where initially you hear the idea and you're going, okay, you know, because I'm not hearing what he's hearing in his head, you know. And then you fast forward and get to the other end of it when it's done and it's just like, well, hell yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, of course, what, what, Snoopy's fucking Christmas song, God damn it, you know, <laughs> and uh, I don't remember whose idea it was to do the original, it might have been my idea, I don't remember, but I think Barry, this is primarily Barry and then Jeff, Barry and Jeff, I think, wrote the lyrics together, if I remember right. I might be wrong. It might be all Jeff. I, I just. I don't know. I was. I, was, I think it's the both of them, though. I was gonna guess Jeff. I haven't actually talked to him about the the nuts and bolts of it, but I was always impressed by this one because it's it's the most overtly personal song I think that Anti Scenes ever written and recorded. Well, um, I think I was the one that came up with the idea of centering it centering it on 76 because that kind of covered an arc of time because Jeff's a little bit older and you know to to where I'm at to where Barry's at kind of in the middle you know and I'm like 76 puts it right in the middle and that kind of covers us you know it was kind of that we wanted that vibe of that you know that kind of had a broader range than just one sort of age frame and like 76 kind of was like the 70s you know and I remember that was part of the, the rationale when we went into writing that. So um, 
Yeah, and that's, you know, that's just a killer little tune, you know. It's just, uh, it's one of those things, again, because we're firing on all cylinders. We're all moving in the same direction. There's no kind of pushback or hiccup. You know, this happens so fast that it's like a hazy memory for me at this point. Yeah. And this song, this song to me embodies a lot of what makes anti scene great because it sounds very simple, you know, when you listen to it, but trying, you know, learning how to play it and play it properly, there's just little steps sideways, little jogs off of the beaten path, and little tiny tricks with timing and whatnot that throw you off. You know, and you really got to be on your toes and pay attention to catch them all. And uh, this is a lot of fun learning how to play this one, especially live. And that's, you know, that's another cool thing. It's like, it's not something that we just can't put, you know, pull out and play live. We played, did we play the Snoopy song too live? We could have. I know, we, I think we just decided to go with just the Christmas 76. Yeah, we just did the original. And of course, we, uh, the vinyl has, uh, kind of the etching, you know, kind of the same sort of that inspiration from the Creamers record and the, the two songs are on the opposite side. Yeah. And um, I mean, this is just a cool little record to have. I think it's just, a, it was a cool thing to do. I mean, I think some people might've scratched their heads over it, but you know, it's like, hey, you know, we can do whatever the hell we want and it's still us. If we do it, it's anti scene. That's right, man. All all the reaction I've seen and heard has been totally positive. People really seem to like this record. I'm just excited because Jamie Vida, look at that art look at that artist's rendering of <laughs> little old me, man. That's that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Haven't got one of the white vinyl copies yet. Just saying. Uh, I don't have a white vinyl copy, I don't think. Is there a white like is there a white vinyl copy? Yeah, uh, did it for Christmas 2020. There's a hundred made on white. I don't have one. I don't have one, Jeff Clayton. Jeff Clayton. <clears throat> you know, there's, there's another hyper limited edition colored vinyl anti scene record I don't have in my collection. Oh. This is the regular version. I got the regular. One. So you're you're talking more like this version. You this one here, the one I have it. in my hand, Son where I can bitch. reach in and pull out the. Uh, Oh, oh, it's colored vinyl. <laughs> I don't like you anymore, Russ Ward. You I'll, say, I'll you know. sell you this, Malcolm. <laughs> yeah. I'll sell you one. Oh, it turned about as fair play, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and it's a different cover, too. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. This was a cool thing to be a part of for me personally because of the fact that it has Jerry A on it. And, you know, that's... When I first was really getting into anti scene, there was a write up in Spin Magazine. Byron Coley was a big fan of anti scene and would write about him. And he, I, and I remember he wrote about, he wrote an article or, you know, his column or whatever in Spin. And he, he said the three best punk bands in America at that time were anti scene, the Lazy Cowgirls, and Poison Idea. So, of course, I immediately had to go and find these bands, you know. And I, you know, I have really taken to the lazy cowgirls, probably do a detriment. Jeff sometimes razzes me when I show up with something. He goes, oh, that sounds like a lazy cowgirl song. Guilty, you know, but Poison Idea, I remember, you know, I bought uh, their album War all the time and just was just, you know, it was like, you know, just some, just really knocked out by how powerful of a band they were. And of course, Feel the Darkness is such a great record and blah, you know, I don't have to sit there and extol you know, whatever. And, you know, to get to this point where I'm doing something, and even though I have not personally met Jerry A, I was not involved in that end of it, you know, to have, to be able to participate in a record where I've shared, you know, re recorded space with them is a, it's a cool thing to be a part of too. It's something that, you know, it's, it's again, it's, and this is, you know, at the risk of sounding like I'm kissing ass or whatever it's just you know again it's it's, it's just also grateful to jeff to have brought me on board on something where i get to do cool stuff like this because i would have never have thought in a thousand years like i've talked about in the last one where i got to a point where i was just like well i'm done with music you know i've done whatever i'm going to do blah 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 and here now 10 years later because jeff said hey man i need some help and i'm like yes i'm here to help you and in in that process i've gotten to go to europe 
I've got to go to Japan. Uh, you know, I've got to make a ton of records. Uh, I got, you know, I've, I've got to make this record, you know, that has Jerry A from Poison Idea. You know, the Christmas record has Jeff Dahl on it. I think Jerry A's on that. Uh, yep. Of course, PP from the Murder Junkies. Uh, Tesco V. Yeah, it's a hell of a thing, not to mention all the anti-scene alum. And, you yeah, know, like what you're saying, this is the kind of thing that you couldn't necessarily do on your own. Just call I would never have, yeah. And say, hey, you know. Hey, hey, it's Ross. Who? Huh? <laughs> yeah, you know. So, you know, to be able to do all this stuff, you know, I've, now I've been a comic book hero, as we saw last week, you know. I've got my own doll, voodoo doll, you know. Yeah. Ain't nothing Gene Simmons got, I ain't got. But again, you know, I'm so lucky that I got brought into this thing. It's a whirlwind. It keeps moving all the time. And it's almost hard. It's, it's hard for me to keep up with, you know. And, you know, I sometimes worry a little bit that Jeff doesn't understand how grateful or my, what my gratitude is to have been brought into this, you know. And I don't think I express that sometimes in, in a proper way. But, you know, I feel really fortunate to have been brought into this and be able to participate in it. And, um uh, Speaking of the whirlwind, let's just roll it on into this one last record here. Yeah, let's get completely up to date, man, right here up to the minute. Guyana Grape. Split 10 inch with Before I Hang, our buddies from Hattiesburg, the cultural mecca of Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And uh, so Jeff come to me a long, long time ago. We were talking about, okay, going back to the um, Die and Breed thing, uh, I think one of the initial ideas was like, we should, if we do covers, you should do covers of like really obscure punk songs, like really obscure. And, you know, like we, I, I started with like Legionnaire's Disease. Nah, that's been done. You know, we got to go deeper than that. And he goes, oh, there's this band from Texas called The Hates. I always love this song of theirs called The Last Hymn. So that was being discussed, I think, even as far back as the initial idea for Dying Breed. And so that had been in his head stewing, and we kept on, you know, it was like one of those kind of back burner things. And then you brought it up to the side burner, and then you brought it over to, you know. And and I was listening to it, and I was like trying to figure out how to play it. We had to play it a little bit different. I had to anti-scenize it. And... Um, you know, we were working on it, and I was like, well, you know, if this is going to be a split, now it, it, at some point it was going to become a split 10-inch. I can't remember what the details on that was. And it was like, well, we have a little more room. we got to come up with another song. And I started kind of thinking about it, and I was like, well, what if we just took the, the whole Jim Jones concept and expanded around the, the hate song, which is about the Jim Jones thing, and when they recorded their original, they, they recorded that like right after it happened back in the 70s. That was like fresh news when they made that record. Um, but, you know, I was like, wait a minute. Malcolm has the recordings, naturally, of Jim Jones committing the act and some other stuff. And I remember having that. I got that from you when I was a kid. I ordered that tape from you once, like a thousand years ago. My first band, we talked about trying to do something like this because we were trying. I, back then, I was thinking like Joe Young's Bury the Needle record where he had the Charlie's Blues. I was like, we ought to do something like that, but it'll be Jim Jones because I have this tape, you know. Yeah. And then that idea was always in my head that somewhere, you know, we could do that. So it was like his idea and my idea. Again, it's like one of those things where we just kind of clicked was like we you know we're just moving in that same direction and and so i started building around that riff and that's how these parts started to develop around the the, the front end and the back end of the middle part if that makes any sense so it's really kind of one song in three parts i guess it's more listed as three songs on the on the record but it's a suite it's kind of like our little it's all you know how many opera it's our version of the elder no, let's not go that far. <laughs> let's say it's more our version of a quick one while he's away. Okay, that uh, we, we, we can agree on that. That's there we go. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, um, so, you know, it really kind of plays as one song is the way it's supposed to go in three parts. So, you know, it's all, 
you know, it's all connected. And really what tied this together so perfectly, again, goes back to Barry's skill, you know, putting in the the sound effects the way they, that he did and making it work, you know. Dude, that's, I would, huh? I, I would um, share my observation about that in his process. Um, I was over at his house hanging out after we had cut the basic tracks um, at the rehearsal studio. And we were listening to the playbacks and, you know, kind of brainstorming. And he said, you know, we, we should put some jungle drums on this. And uh, I was like, yeah, jungle drums. But anybody who knows me, you know, my, my scrawny 136 pound frame, I run out of energy if I go too far without meals. So I said, you know what? I'm starving. I, I got to get some food. I, I need to go into the house and eat something. He said, well, all right, you go eat. I'll, I'll, I'll just stay out here. And so I went inside, you know, got some supper, you know, brushed my teeth, came back out to the studio and he had the whole percussion track recorded, mixed and ready to go. And some of the, the percussion instruments he used on them are so wacky. I'm not gonna reveal any surprises, but he used some really left of center, really wild types of little percussion instruments to get this jungle drum sound on the record. And I was, Suitably impressed. And, and do you know why he can do that? Why? Because he's a goddamn professional. I believe it. I've seen it. I believe it. It's the truth. Hey, I think that's kind of, I think it's kind of Barry's high watermark since I've joined the band as far as like the production and stuff. I mean, the way that all came together, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's, it was ambitious for us, but again, you know, we did it, so therefore it is us. You know? Yeah, and it, it is, it's great because the entire thing, every bit of it is tied together between the three songs from the very, very intro sounds to the very last outro sounds on the last song. It all ties together. And that's all theory, you know? You got yeah. all it together, everything. I was a little worried when I came up with the idea. I was like, well, if we tie it together as one long kind of sweet... <laughs> You know, I was like, hey, they might laugh at me. You know, yeah, it's like, hey, you can be laughed at here and kind of ridiculed. But they kind of, you know, they, everybody was like, yeah. And then off you went. Yeah, so. I, I never had any compunction about it at all. I mean, still, from the fan perspective, I, I, I thought it was a great idea. You know, I was like, sure, three songs, why not? You know, because I'm, I'm a fan of, you know, The Who and anybody else who's ever done any kind of a sweet or a medley or a rock opera. I love the idea. And there's so many bands out there who wouldn't do something like that. We yeah. did. Great. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. And just to toot Barry's horn a little bit, he's been sending me some demos from the new batch of stuff we're recording. And there's some, I think there's going to be some interesting production tricks on this new album that we're working on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't want to divulge secrets. Don't want to be a spoiler, but I think that all of our frantic fans and loyal listeners and vibratory viewers are in for a treat. Just saying. I think Just we're, I think we're about seven songs deep into this now. I mean, there's been more than seven written. There's some stuff that we've discarded, you know. Hmm. They don't get res resurrected or whatever. But right now we've got, you know, several, there's just a handful finished and several very strong starts that look like they're going to, you know, pull together here right directly. We, you know, we got together Friday and I had been given a demo that I thought we were going to, like Barry had just done by himself. And um, I thought we were going to cut it again. And with me playing guitar to get a more kind of correct, quote unquote, kind of, sound or idea of it so i was like in mind said okay we're getting ready to go and do this and i get there and jeff's like well you know i was just he he was he kept going back to this set of lyrics that you sent down and he's like you what do you, you kind of think that you know we could work with this you know it's like i, I want to do something kind of like you know kind of more fast kind of you know hardcore or whatever and i was like well i got yeah i got this you know we went through some wrestles like i got this one and the next thing you know, but you know, about two hours later, we cut another demo of a whole new thing that we basically built from the ground up. Great. Right. And it's just like the stuff like that is just like, you know, 
that's when you you realize you know it's pretty inspiring to be able to just I, I show up with no idea that this is what we're getting ready to do and come out of it and then later that night Barry's taking it home and he's kind of got it mixed down a little bit to where you know we got a, a, a serviceable demo yeah there's you know you know I can't imagine that anybody ever had any doubts but there's just proof that uh, this band still got a lot of petrol in the tank yeah it's it's pretty amazing and you know I, I just like come home and I was like did we just do that <laughs> so right on well that this has been a dynamite episode of the uh auto discography version of uh the anti-scene shoot interview man great fun we've already been at it for an hour and 13 minutes and it went by just like that all right hopefully everybody out there has enjoyed it so far at least as much as i have Bad Brother Ward. I don't know if you enjoyed it. One tiny, itty bitty little bit. Uh, you know, I don't enjoy none. No, I enjoyed it. It was, it was great. I, I, how long did you say it was? Oh, now, well, we're about an hour and 13 minutes at this Damn, point. it doesn't. It felt like it was like 30. I know. I know. It's crazy, but awesome. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to, um, as of this speaking, if I recall correctly, we're scheduled to do some demos in about. Like I'm supposed to go down there in about six weeks to do some serious hardcore recording. So that's kind of the time frame I'm operating on. So we shall see. Yeah, well, we'll see. And while we're seeing, we invite everybody to A, subscribe to the Anti-Scene Official, Anti-Scene Official YouTube channel. Keep an eye on the Facebook for live episodes of Break On Through, starring the unimpeachable president for life, Jeff Clayton. That's every Tuesday, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, live. And look for peri periodic, episodic versions and episodes of the Malcolm Tent shoot interview with anti-scene alum and fellow travelers such as Mad Brother Ward. And Mad Brother, thanks for doing this, man. It's been really cool, a lot of fun. Well, thank you, Malcolm. I've enjoyed it. Right on, man. And uh, that wraps it up, kids. So I don't know when I'll be back, but I intend to be back. And so until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State. <laughs>